ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد as to what proceeds Firstly, I would like to apologize for arriving late due to traffic and some other reasons. So I hope, inshallah, your brothers and sisters will forgive us for coming late. Secondly, with regards to our discussion today, which is Makanatu Sunnah fil Islam, the status of Sunnah in Al Islam. Now, many brothers and sisters whenever they have a discussion with regards to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we frequently hear the term that is being used, and that is that this is sunnah, and this is not from the sunnah, and is this the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But many of us do not understand what does the word sunnah mean. So with regards to understanding what the word sunnah means, and we can say that the definition of sunnah can be broken into three categories. The linguistic meaning of the word sunnah. Lughatan, like we say in the Arabic language. The secondly, shar'an, Islamically, what does the word sunnah mean? And thirdly, istilahan, technically, the word sunnah defined by the scholars of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah or the Ahlul Hadith. So, this first subcategory that we have, we will say that this is known as the definition of sunnah. Ta'rifu sunnah, the definition of sunnah. And the definition of sunnah is further divided into three categories. So, the word sunnah in the Arabic language, firstly, Linguistically means a siratu wa tariqa, a way or an example, a way of life, a pathway, a path or a way of life. A tariqa meaning a way, and a sira meaning a way of life. That's why we hear the word the sira of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When we hear the word sira of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It indicates the way of life, that the way of life, how the Prophet ﷺ lived, how he would eat, drink, and how he would make ibadah, and everything relating to the Prophet. ﷺ. So the words sunnah and sirah, sirah are synonymous, mutaradif in the Arabic language, and they have the exact meaning. So the word sunnah in the Arabic language means asiratu wa tariqah. A way or a way of life, regardless of whether that way or that way of life is good or bad, good or evil, regardless. So this is what the word sunnah means in the Arabic language. Secondly, the word sunnah, Islamically, shar'an. And the word shar'an and istilahan, Islamically and technically. A lot of the people cannot differentiate and distinguish the difference between something which is shar'an and something which is istilahan, Islamically and technically. Islamically or shar'an is something which is derived directly from the Quran or from the, or the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And something which is istilahan or technically is something which the scholars, when they look into the Quran and the Sunnah, they stipulate and derive a definition. So is it, there is a difference between shar'an and istilahan. Something which is Islamically and something which is technically. 
So the word sunnah, Islamically or shar'an, it means to obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in everything that he commanded us to do so. And to abstain from whatever he prohibited or forbade us to do so. This is the definition of the word sunnah Islamically. And this meaning of the word sunnah Islamically can be found in the book of Allah in Surah Al-Hashr in ayah number 7. وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ أَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا And take whatever the messenger gives you and abstain from whatever he forbids you. This second category of the word of the this second category of the word sunnah Islamically has been divided into a further four categories by the scholars of Islam. So the word sunnah Islamically is divided into four categories. The first category is that whenever the Prophet ﷺ commands you to do something, it will either be obligatory or it will be highly recommended. So it either, either it will be fard or either it will be mustahab. The third and the fourth category, whenever the Prophet ﷺ forbids us to do something, it will be either be haram or either it will be disliked, makruh. So this definition of the word sunnah Islamically has four categories. Obligatory, highly recommended, prohibited or unlawful and, and disliked. So that is which is fard or mustahab or haram Makruh. So this is with regards to the, uh, the second category, which is the word sunnah Islamically. The third category is the understanding of the word sunnah as defined by the scholars, technically. What does the word sunnah mean? Technically. Istilahan. So when we look at the scholars who have defined the word sunnah technically, we find three groups of scholars in three different areas that have defined the sunnah. The first group of scholars are the Ahlul Hadith or the Muhaddithun who have defined the sunnah. The second group of scholars are the jurists, the fuqaha. And the third group of scholars are the usuliyun, those who are experts in usul al-fiqh. Every single group has defined sunnah, the word sunnah technically, in a different manner. That which is related to their specific area. But the best definition that has been given to the word sunnah technically, and that which relates to all the Muslims on a daily basis, is the definition which has been given by the scholars of hadith, the Ahlul Hadith or Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. And their definition of the word Sunnah is everything that is connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Everything that can be connected directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from his speech, from his actions, from his tacit approvals, and his moral and physical description. So five things. The scholars of hadith, they divide the sunnah technically, that the word sunnah, when the word, is, when the word sunnah is used by the scholars of hadith, they say that the word sunnah consists of five things. The statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one. The actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number two. Number three, the tacit approvals. The tacit approvals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Something happened or occurred in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remained silent and gave consent to it. Then this is regarded as being a tacit approval of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Fourthly, his moral descriptions, his manners, his etiquettes. And fifthly, his physical description, the shama'il 
how tall the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, how tall he used to be, how long was his beard, his descriptions, his physical features. This is with regards to the scholars of hadith, that they say that the sunnah technically consists of five things. So after we have understood this now, we understand that the, word, the definition of the word sunnah is divided into three categories. The meaning of the word sunnah in the Arabic language, the meaning of the word sunnah Islamically, and the meaning of the word sunnah Islamically is divided into four categories, and the meaning of the word sunnah technically as defined by the Ahlul Hadith, the scholars of Hadith, which is divided into five categories. After we have understood this, then now we shall explain to you the meaning of the word sunnah according to the Ahlul Hadith. We mentioned that everything that is connected or pertaining to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to his statements, which is known as as sunnatul Qawliyyah. And as sunnatul Qawliyyah is a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For example, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ that actions indeed are according to your intentions. So this was a statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So anything which the Prophet Sallallahu a statement that he made with regards to the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then that is to be regarded to be a, a sunnah, a sunnah al qawliyyah, a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at times being obligatory, at times being highly recommended, at times being prohibited and at times being disliked. The four categories which we mentioned previously. So this is a statement of the Prophet ﷺ which is known as as sunnatul qawliya. The second category is as sunnatul fa'liya. The actions of the Prophet ﷺ. So something which the Prophet ﷺ did. Now with regards to this category, the second category which is the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we have the brothers, many Muslim brothers and sisters, this category is always under discussion. So we have brothers and sisters arguing or discussing or conversing on the issue of whether to wear a turban is a sunnah, whether to keep long hair is a sunnah. Whether to wear a hat is a sunnah. Whether to wear a thawb is a sunnah. And so forth. So we always have brothers and sisters, they discuss this issue. And we always have some expressing their opinions. Some saying it's a sunnah. Some saying it's not a sunnah. Most of those who discuss this issue are ignorant. Illa marahim Allah. Or those who have firm knowledge or have studied and understood the definitions as defined by the scholars or in the manner which we have presented to you from the works of the scholars. So one question to the brothers and brothers here present is Naam, who thinks that wearing a turban is a sunnah? Or who thinks it's not a sunnah? And whoever thinks it's a sunnah, tell him to give us the reason of why it's a sunnah. And the one who says it's not a sunnah, then tell him we ask him to explain to us why it's not a sunnah. Naam. Who from amongst the brothers can answer this question? Is wearing a hat a sunnah, a topi, like we say in the Urdu language, a topi? Is topi a naam? Tafadal. Taib. Taib. It's a sunnah to cover the head. So if you cover the head in any manner, it's a sunnah. Taib. Taib. With regards to growing long, the Prophet ﷺ had long hair. The Indians and the Pakistanis, they call this zulfa. You know, you have the, the hairs, a particular group, they keep their hairs in a very manner, and they call this zulfa. They say this is sunnah. Taib. To keep long hair is a sunnah, 
Huh? Who thinks? What about the turban? Turban's always under discussion. We have many people that come to us when they visit Medina, the Prophet grave, and they look at us and they say, Astaghfirullah, why don't you wear a sunnah? Why are you wearing this shimag? Why are you wearing this? Why don't you wear a sunnah? Why do you guys not practice? First they say to me that you Arabs don't practice wearing the Amama. First of all, I said to him, I'm not an Arab, I'm an Indian. But regardless of the case, so you find some of them being hyper and very optimistic. And this zeal is good, how to have love for the Sunnah. But if this zeal has no knowledge, then this zeal will lead you to destruction, this enthusiasm. So this is under discussion. Naam. We need our brothers to answer. This is something which, like I said, this is something which is basic. We should know this because we're always talking about the sunnah. Every time we have a discussion, regardless, regardless to whether we agree or disagree with somebody, our way of understanding something is to understand it whether this is from the sunnah. Especially Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the Ahlul Hadith, they always present their arguments by presenting the Quran and the sunnah. So, for example, uh, those brothers who are wearing shirts and trousers, they, are they doing something which is against the sunnah? There's many brothers that are wearing here shirts and trousers. So I'm not wearing a shirt and a trouser. So what would our perception be with regards to this? Will we look at these brothers in a funny way and say, you know, this guy is, look, he's wearing something odd, a jeep. He's not Islamic. Do you understand? You can be more Islamic if you wear a thobe or a shalwar kameez. This is always under discussion. So we need to understand this based upon clear knowledge. Before I answer, is there anybody who would like to enlighten us or to share their knowledge with us? Something which they have read or something which they know with regards to the Sunnah of Rasul. Because this is our discussion. We decided that we are going to lecture on this subject because we saw the importance. Because if the Ahlu, if Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a, if the Masajid of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'a do not know what is Sunnah, then what can be expected to those who are away from the Sunnah? Hmm? There's a question that asks: If we claim ourselves to be the true Sunnis, the Ahlul Hadith, and Ahlul Hadith and Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'a are the exact the synonymous, understand the same identity, just with a different ascription. So, ha, who knows? Anybody? Knows with regards to that uh, what is sunnah, what is not a sunnah. Tayyib, then I will answer. Do you want me to answer? Tayyib. When we look at the actions of the Prophet, wasallam, the actions, we're talking about the second category of the sunnah. We said that the muhaddithin divided the sunnah into five categories. The statements, we've, we've covered that by giving you an example. The Prophet made a statement. The second is the actions. We say that the actions of the Prophet ﷺ can be divided into three categories. Those actions which the Prophet ﷺ did on the basis of ibadah. Nobody disputes those to be, if they are not obligatory, then nobody disputes those to be a sunnah. For example, the Prophet ﷺ prayed two rakats of Salatul Fajr before the obligatory prayers. Everybody says that this is a sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ, he did siwak. And ordered us to do siwak, and we know that siwak is not obligatory, but highly recommended. So these are sunnahs that nobody has disputes. When we look into the, the biography of the Prophet the second category that we find from his actions, are those actions which the Prophet did on the basis of it being his custom. So those actions which the Prophet did on the basis of those actions being the custom of his people. As we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was from amongst the Arabs. He was from amongst the Arabs. He lived in the Arabian Peninsula and the Hijaz. And he was from Makkah. And from amongst the Makkah, he was from the tribe of Quraysh. And from, and from uh, the Quraysh, he was from Banu Hashim. And from Banu Hashim, he was from Banu Abdul Muttalib and so forth. So when we look at some of the actions which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, then those actions which the Prophet ﷺ did, he did it because this was the custom of his people. So for example, the Prophet ﷺ wore a turban. And it was from the custom of his people to wear a turban. So we saw that Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab also wore a turban. We saw that the Prophet ﷺ kept long hair. 
So the, his people used to keep long hair as well, regardless of whether they accepted Islam or they didn't accept Islam. We're talking about the Muslims and the pagans. So when he entered Makkah, we find the Prophet system had plaits, he had long hair. Now, Naam, because the Arabs at the time, the custom. Naam. Taib. Taib. Naam. Well, uh, this is your opinion. With regards to this, Imam Ahmad was asked this question. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahmatullahi was asked this question. And Imam ibn Qayyim has mentioned this in Zadul Ma'at. So I refer to Zadul Ma'at. I refer under the discussion of keeping long hair or not keeping long hair from the features of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we also find in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Shamail, that he kept short hair as well. Understand? He kept short... It, it, in what time he used to have long hair? In what time he used to have when he entered Makkah, in Fatih Makkah, yeah. he had long hair and he had plaits, as been mentioned in the Sunnah. Naam, refer to Zad al-Ma'ad. Tayyib. <coughs> so with regards to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we find that the custom of the people was to cover their heads that the Arabs they would cover their heads by wearing headgear or we call a topi and wearing um, uh, the amama and we find that the, the Arabs used to keep it was customary amongst them to keep long hair as well like I mentioned so we find that these are from the custom actions or the customary actions that we find amongst the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's people. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was also from amongst the Arabs. So when, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given the responsibility of being a, a prophet, prophethood was given to him, the responsibility. And when he was given the responsibility of being a messenger, we find that when he migrated to Medina and so forth, we find that the Prophet Sallallahu continued with the dressing and that no specific difference of dress code was said to the people of, uh, to the Muslims. The Muslims continued to do so because the Muslims were also from the Arabs. They were from Mecca and many of them from Medina. So we find that many of these actions are from the customs of the people. So therefore anything which is from the customs of the people cannot be classified or declared as being a sunnah. That is the asal that we fly from the Ahlul Ilm and from the Ahlul Hadith that they say that the customary acts of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cannot be classified as being a Sunnah. The third category of the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is those actions which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did habitually. So for example, we find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam liked to eat pumpkin. So this was something which was habitually as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a human being. We know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a human being. As Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشْرُ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَاهُكُمْ إِلَاهُ وَاحِدٌ Say, O oh Muhammad, to the people that indeed I am a human being like you, except that revelation is revealed to me. So we find that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a human being. He was rahmatul lil alameen. He, is a, he was the mercy to the whole of this universe with the guidance that he came with. That the Islam that he came with became a guidance for the, the guidance that he came in. That he himself was a mercy for the whole of this universe. So we find that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with regards to um, having habitual likes and dislikes, for example, liking the pumpkin, then it is not from the sunnah to say that if you eat pumpkin, then the pumpkin is a sunnah. Because this was from the habitual uh, likes or dislikes of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the evidence for this is in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Once when Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Uh, Khalid, uh, Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. When he was dining with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A, a lizard was presented to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, when, whilst eating and he abstained from e eating the lizard. So Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu ta'ala anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is this haram? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said no. 
He says something. This is something which is not common amongst the lands of the in the lands of the Arabs. We don't have these. We don't eat this type of dish or this lizard. So therefore, Khalid ibn Walid radiAllahu taala anhu, he ate the lizard, uh, understanding that it was a. This uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not prefer to eat the lizard because something which is not known. As we know that different cultures. In different regions, geography, we have different types of dishes. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you are an Arab, you have to like what the Pakistanis eat. And if you are a Pakistani, you like what the Arabs eat and so forth. Everybody has their different ways of cooking and eating and so forth. So this was something which was not common. So we find that Khalid ibn Walid, he ate the lizard. And he ate it on the, uh, whilst dining in the presence of the Prophet ﷺ. So nobody will say that not eating a lizard is a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because this was from the habitual, you can say, likes or dislikes or, or preference of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So when we look into the sunnah as the Ahlul Ilm have defined, we find that the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam can be divided into three categories: those actions which the Prophet sallallahu did on the basis of ibadah, those actions which the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did on the basis of the custom of his people. And those actions which the Prophet Sallallahu did habitually. So the second and the third category cannot be defined as being a sunnah. But with regards to the first category, then yes, the first category, that which the Prophet Sallallahu did on the basis of ibadah, then this is regarded as being a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu which is highly recommended if it is not an obligation. But when we look, for example, with regards to the dressing, we find that the Prophet Sallallahu he instructed the Muslim Ummah that which was obligatory upon them to cover, defining the satara, the awra of a Muslim, saying from the belly button to up to the uh, knees. But the Prophet ﷺ did not, uh, you can say, um, did, uh, did not instruct the Muslim Ummah of a special type of dressing. The Prophet ﷺ accepted different types of clothing that were given to him from Yemen, from, from Misr, from um, Yemen, from Egypt, and so forth. So it shows that the people dressed differently and we don't find that the Prophet ﷺ everywhere in the sunnah saying that you have to dress in a particular manner and you have to do, do some uh, dress in this manner or to adopt this type of dressing. And this was from the hikmah of the Prophet ﷺ because we know that in order for us to classify something to be the sunnah, then the sunnah has to have evidence. We cannot declare anything to be sunnah. So we cannot say that to wear, as a, to keep long hair is a sunnah unless there is text to say that it is sunnah or the Prophet ﷺ recommended it. We cannot say, declare anything to be a sunnah unless there is text because in order for something to be sunnah, then sunnah is a form of revelation. We know that revelation is of two types, the Quran and the sunnah. And we know revelation is knowledge. And knowledge comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوهَىٰ And he does not speak from his desires, rather it is a revelation that is revealed to him. So when the Prophet ﷺ speaks with regards to the deen, then it has to be revelation, and if it is revelation, then it can only be legislated as being a sunnah. With regards to something which is not part of the deen, then this will either be habitually or customary when we look into the actions of the Prophet ﷺ. So therefore, the most preferred or the correct opinion with regards to these actions which are with regards to wearing a turban or with regards to wearing or doing other things which the Prophet ﷺ did which were customary then that which is the most correct opinion is that it is not a sunnah but if somebody was to do it out of loving the messenger of Allah iqtida'an then he will be rewarded by making the iqtida, but that action in itself, for example, wearing a turban, will not be regarded as being a sunnah in itself. But the person will be rewarded, as Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was asked, and he said, Narju an yuthaba alay, and we hope that he will be rewarded for following the sunnah, following the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But with regards to wearing an amama, or anybody who d decides that he wants to wear an amama, then he should wear it in the manner in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wore it, and most of the people who we see that wear the amama, they do not wear it in the way that the Prophet ﷺ wore it, as it has been described in the Shama'il. With regards to the, the other type of dressing that we wear, 
and the issue that we have remaining is with regards to um, the Islamic dressing, for example, what I, what I am wearing, or where, whether you wear shalwar and kameez, then this is something which can be regarded as being a Muslim identity. So if, and we can say that this is a Muslim identity, we cannot say it's a sunnah. So it is something which distinguishes the Muslims from the disbelievers. So if on those bases, if the Muslims are to wear to make themselves uh, distinct or distinguished, then there is no harm with regards to doing so. But that which is recommended or accepted by the scholars is that it is permissible for you to wear the dressing of the, of the land that you li live in as long as that dressing or that clothing which you are wearing is, does not represent or resemble the kuffar. For example, if you were to wear, like the normal, our normal brothers, they wear a shirt and a trousers, then nobody says that this man is a Jew or a Christian. It's become a normal dressing amongst the people. As long as the satar is covered, then this is the orf, and there is no harm in doing so. But thinking that this brother who does so is opposing the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and he's wearing, as we know that all those type of dressings are impermissible, which resemble or imitate the kuffar, as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, man tashabbaha biqawmin fa huwa minhu. And resemblance means that if you were to wear those, that type of clothing, by, by just looking at you, I would be able to say that you are a Christian, which is not the case now. It may have been so in the past and so forth, but the case now in which we live in, as the Muslims who live here as a minority, as Aqaliyatul Islamiyah, then we find that normal dressing, just trou trousers and, and, and shirt and so forth, is just a normal dressing which is known as the dressing of the people. So therefore, it is and it's Muslim identity, if somebody was to wear the shalwar kameez or that, and if the brothers were to wear that, as long as their private parts are not transparent or visible, then there is no harm for them to wear something. Following the fashion and f adopting the fashion of the kuffar, that's another issue. But with regards to just normal dressing, then they say that this is the orf of the people, and this is finally and accepted by all the scholars of the sunnah. So with regards to this, so it becomes clear to us now that with regards to an amama and with regards to the hat. With regards to an hat, then we have uh, an issue. With regards to the hat, then we find that wearing the hat is a, which is, is, which is a common practice amongst, was a common practice amongst the Arabs. Till, till this day, we find that many of the Arabs, the elderly, um, the elderly Arabs, they would see it as an aib to leave the house bareheaded. And this is amongst the Arabs. And with regards to wearing uh, the, the hat when you are praying, then some of the Ahlul Ilm have said and made, have made istidlal with the ayah, Ya Bani Adam tukum inda kulli masjid. The old children of Adam, beautify yourselves when coming, in a, when coming to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And some of the Ahlul Ilm that they have said that the akmal and the ashraf way of beautifying yourself is to cover your head. Then this is in terms of beautification and, complete, and, and being complete. If everybody is covering their head, then it is better for you to cover your head. And if you are from amongst the people, that the custom like the Arabs, the custom of the Arabs was that they would never come out of their houses bareheaded. So it is better for you to cover your head based upon this ayah. But the scholars have said that if you are from a region where your head is not covered, then if you do not cover your head, there is no harm. And in the multicultural society that we live in here, a mix of cultures, then we find that some people cover their head and some people do not cover their head. There is no one uh, urf or custom that we follow. So therefore, if you cover your head, this is akmal and better in terms of zina when praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you don't cover your head, then there is no harm. And this is what the most balanced opinion is because we find extremes on both sides. We find those who say that you have to cover your head and this is a sunnah. With regards to it being a sunnah, then we say that it's from the custom reactions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallam wore a hat, but because he was from the Arabs, and the Arabs covered their heads. And we find in the writings of the Arabs that until the, the British and the Europeans colonized the Arab countries, then everybody would wear a hat, and then the Arabs, this custom of them wearing and covering their heads faded away. So if you are living amongst the people where everybody covers their head, then it is better for you to cover your head and follow the custom of the people. But if there is a people from amongst the people who do not cover their head, then there is no harm for them.
to be beheaded. And we find that the Sahaba Zalidwan Allahi Alayhi Majma'een in the Sahih we find that they prayed with a single garment. They prayed with a single garment with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said where they covered their, their, their private parts and this shows that many of them would not cover their head because that was the only garment that they had. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said that those of you who have one garment then let them pray so in one garment and those of you who had two garments then let them pray so in the two garments with two garments covering the izar and the rida. So with regards to the most balanced opinion with regards to the hat is that the hat is also a customary practice but based upon this ayah Ya Bani Adam in kulli masjid some of the scholars have said that it is better and recommended for you to cover your, cover your head when you pray this is better afdal and ashraf and if you do not su do so then your salah is accepted but that which is just khilaf awla according to some of the scholars if you are living in an, uh, amongst the people who everybody that covers their head but if you are living amongst people who don't cover their heads then there is no obligation of saying to those people that you cover, have to cover the head those who go to two extremes and say that you have to cover your head and those who go to another extreme who say that you shouldn't cover your head then this extremism is not good on both sides that which is correct is the balanced opinion that covers so if you are able to do so and living in England I feel that uh, living in a multicultural society that if you cover your head or if you don't cover your head it is okay but to cover your head is better and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best so this was with regards to uh, the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So we find with regards to the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That the customary and the habitual actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Will not be regarded as being a sunnah Because sunnah is based upon evidence And evidence is revelation And revelation means that it has to be directly from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala And one of the ways of determining something to be a sunnah and not a sunnah is that when you do an action which is sunnah, highly recommended and not obligatory, there is a reward for that action. So we don't find the Prophet ﷺ say that if you wear a hat, you get an extra reward. We don't find the Prophet ﷺ say that if you wear an, a turban, you will get extra reward. We don't find the Prophet ﷺ say that if you keep long hair, you get extra reward. So this shows that in order for something to be sunnah, the thumb rule is that there has to be jaza and thawab involved in that action because then that becomes the part of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there is no reward, or jaza or thawab with regards to that action then that cannot be classified as being sunnah but if somebody follows the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam iqtida'an bil umum then he will get the reward of following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in its generality for loving the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and trying to imitate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala knows best with regards to the third type of uh, the third category of the sunnah defined by the scholars of, um, of Ahl Sunnah then or the Ahlul Hadith, then they are the tacit approvals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, with regards to the second sunnah, I forgot to give an example. And an example is, with regards to something which the Prophet Sallallahu did out of action. The example for that is the Hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me pray. So we saw that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam done an action where he commanded the companions to do and pray in the manner which he has prayed. So he prayed on the mimbar and he showed the companions how to pray. So therefore to pray uh, how the Prophet Sallallahu prayed, then this sunnah is that a sunnah which consists of statements as well as the Prophet Sallallahu exemplifying for us how to pray. So that was an example with regards to a action of the Prophet Sallallahu in doing a sunnah. So therefore we know that the person who does not pray the, how the Prophet Sallallahu prayed, then he has opposed the way of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The third is the tacit approvals of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then we find that some, so, certain companions, uh, Ridwan Allahi Alaihi Majma'een, they did certain actions in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam approved them. From amongst those actions is that after Salatul Fajr, we find some of the companions who had missed their two rakats of praying the Sunnah. After the Salah, they got up and they prayed and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not disapprove of this and he gave consent. So hence, those who have missed their sunnahs after, before the f f Fajr obligatory prayer, it is sunnah for them to pray the two rakats of uh, Salatul Fajr which they missed. In the very same way, after Salatul Maghrib, the Adhan of Salatul Maghrib, we find many of the companions that they prayed the two rakats after the Adhan and between the Iqamah. And the Prophet Sallallahu gave consent to this as well as he practiced this himself. But we saw the companions with one Allah alayhi do, doing, doing so. Then he saw them and he did not disapprove of this. So this became a, a, a tacit approval, uh, a sunnah 
of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which is known as a sunnah to taqririya, a tacit approval from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The fourth category is the moral descriptions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we find that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, with regards to his etiquettes, with regards to his manners, when it came to ibadah, when it came to transactions, when it came to dealing with the people, and as Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an, that the, that the moral, you can say, description of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was everything that, you could be, that could be found in the Qur'an. So whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed the human beings to do, the Muslims to do, then we find that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was those from amongst those who, who perfected that and followed that which, the Prophet, uh, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had commanded. The fifth category is the shama'il or the descriptions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam then you find that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam how tall he was what type of a beard he had and how long he was and how he would eat how he would talk how he would walk and so forth so this is the fifth category of the uh, sunnah defined by the scholars of hadith um, ridwanullahi alayhim ajma'in With regards to understanding after, alhamdulillah, covering what the word sunnah means in the Arabic language, what it means Islamically, and its categories, what it means technically, and as defined by the scholars of hadith in five different categories and explaining to them and explaining to you the three categories of the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu the first being ibadah or the sunnah, which is not obligatory, and the other second two categories being habitually or customary, which according to the most correct opinion, is not to be regarded as being a sunnah, but if somebody was to generally follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he would be rewarded as following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam generally, but not for those specific actions as being declared as being sunnah. The next question that we would like to ask is basically the connection that the sunnah has with the Quran. What is the connection with regards to the Quran and the sunnah? Why is there a need for us to have the sunnah? The word of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the Quran. This is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kalam Allah. So why is there a need for the sunnah? Why do we need the sunnah? So the question is, the connection, what does the connection of the Qur'an, what is the connection between the Qur'an and the sunnah? Ah, who knows? Naam. Naam. Mumtaz. Naam. Naam, anybody? Naam, yes, Sheikh. The Quran is a theory, like a theory text. And the Sunnah is like practice. We will not use the word theory test, but we will say that the Quran. Naam. The Quran is where the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are used. When we give examples, we should use examples. I understand exactly what you mean. But when we, when we speak about the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will say that the Qur'an is where all the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are there, and the sunnah is the, where we find its explanations. So obviously, mashallah, the brothers answered correctly, with regards to what the scholars of uh, the Ahlul Hadith, when they explain the connection between the Qur'an and the sunnah, they say that the, the connection between the Qur'an and the sunnah can be divided into three categories. The first category with regards to the connection of the Qur'an and the Sunnah is that the Qur'an is that the Sunnah has come as mu'ayyida wa muwafaqa li ahkam al-Qur'an min haythu al-ijmal that an takuna mu'ayyidatun wa muwafaqatun li ahkam al-Qur'an min haythu al-ijmal which means that we find for example in the Qur'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa aqimu salah establish the prayer in the sunnah, we will find that also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he confirmed what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said. As in the hadith in Sahih Al-Bukhari, of the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, where the Prophet Sallallahu said that Islam has been built upon five pillars. And then he mentioned the first pillar being the shahada, and then he mentioned the second pillar where he said, establishing the prayer. So in this narration, he didn't explain. So we find that the Quran, it confirms and aids and strengthens that which Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran in terms of its generality. Mu'ayyidatun wa muwafaqatun li ahkam al-Quran min haythu al-ijmal. 
The second category is, was the brothers mentioned, that the Quran, the Sunnah explains the Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَقِيمُ salah." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, establish the prayer. And the Prophet ﷺ says in an authentic hadith, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli si as you have seen me pray. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran where he says, Wa anzalna ilayka dhikra li tubayyina lil nas. Ma nuzzila ilayhim wa la'allahu yatafakkurun. And we have revealed this dhikr, the Quran, so that you may explain it to the people. Ma nuzzila, that which has been revealed to them. Li tubayyina lil nas, ma nuzzila ilayhim. So the Quran, the tafsir of the Quran, is done with sunnah. The sunnah explains the Quran. But without the sunnah, it would be literally impossible to understand the Quran. Because the Prophet ﷺ was sent as a messenger and his job as a messenger or his responsibility was to explain everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed in his book. And this was done through the teach by um, through Jibreel alayhi salam who came and taught him and informed him of everything. So this is the second category of the Quran, the connection between the Quran and the Sunnah. The third category is that we find many rulings or many injunctions that we can find in the Sunnah, we don't find them in the Quran, many things. And that shows you the great level, the, the greatness of the Quran. For example, we find, we do not find in the Quran anywhere that a grandmother in terms of inheritance is given a sudus, one-sixth of uh, the, inherit uh, in the, the inheritance. We find this where? In the sunnah. We know the famous incident when, that, when the grandmother came to Abu Bakr, she asked for her right. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said that I do not find anything in the book of Allah. Then he asked anybody that, does anybody know anything that has been mentioned in the sunnah? And a companion came forward, and another companion came forward to testify that when, the, that he witnessed also that the Prophet ﷺ said that a grandmother is given a sixth of the inheritance. In the same way we find nowhere in the Quran that when a man is married to a woman, it is impermissible for him to take his wife's maternal or paternal auntie as a second wife. His kha, the khala of his wife or the amma of his wife is maternal, his, like we say in Urdu, khala and pupi, as the second wife. So it is impermissible for you to marry your wife's auntie, paternal or maternal, as a second wife. We don't find this in the Quran, but we find this in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this shows that the status of the sunnah, the makana of the sunnah is great. That those who reject the sunnah have indeed rejected the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And without the sunnah we would be lost. So we understand that in terms of min haythul hujjah, in terms of an authority, in terms of evidence, then the Quran and sunnah are equal. In terms of status, the Quran is above and the Sunnah is second. In terms of status, we have the Quran and then we have the Sunnah. In terms of the Hujjah, of them being an authority, then the Quran and the Sunnah is exactly the same. There is no difference. If something is established in the Sunnah authentically, based upon the principles, then that can be taken regardless of whether it's your Aqeedah or whether it's an issues of Fiqh in any aspects of the deen. If it is sahih and proven from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then it is accepted. Whether it be the bab of aqidah or whether it be the bab of fiqh, and this is the madhab of Ahlul Hadith and the madhab of Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah. So this is we find that the Quran and the Sunnah, the connection between the Quran and the Sunnah is that the Sunnah has come, come to strengthen, to confirm that which has been mentioned in the Quran, the Sunnah has come to explain that which has been mentioned in the Quran. And the Sunnah has many rulings that cannot be found in the Quran. And as we know that the Sunnah is also revelation, that the Prophet ﷺ does not speak from his desire. That's why the Sunnah has been legislated as an authority. And in terms of proof and evidence, 
has the same has the same status of the Quran in terms of authority, but the but in terms of its status, then it is second. But in terms of authority, then the Quran and the Sunnah are equal. So this is with regards to the connection of the Sunnah with the Quran. So that's why we say when people ask us, why do we need the Quran? Why do we need the Sunnah? We will say we need the Sunnah because of three things. Because the Sunnah confirms to us, the Sunnah explains, and we find many things in the Sunnah. As we know, another example which is commonly given is that if somebody was to commit, commit adultery and is married, the stoning of the person that is that uh, will be uh, given the punishment of, of digging a hole and stoning him to the death, although there was a qira'ah in the Quran which is mansukh, we will find this today remaining and it being explained in the Sunnah. In the present Quran that we have, that ayah was mansukh, we don't find it, but we find it in the present and preserved where? In the Sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After we have understood this, then we need to know with regards to the divisions of the Sunnah. The divisions of the Sunnah are two. A Sunnah to Sariha, which is a clear Sunnah, and a Sunnah to Dhimniya, which is an implicit Sunnah, or something which is not clear for many people. A Sunnah to Sariha is, if all of us were to read this, we would understand that it is a Sunnah. So for example, if you were to read in a collection of Hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ, would pray the night prayer and the night prayer is a sunnah. So everybody would be able to understand that, that this is a sunnah. That the Prophet ﷺ instructed us to do sivak. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to do this action and that action. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to do charity. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to smile when we look at our brothers and so forth. We know that these are old sunnah and acts of the Prophet ﷺ, which if a layman was to read, he would understand to be he would understand them to be a sunnah, which are clear, which do not require explanation. Then there are those sunnahs which require explanation. Only the students of knowledge and the scholars would understand them as being sunnah. So they take the same ruling as being a sunnah, but they are not clear. But they are a sunnah. And from amongst the examples that we find is that, for example, when a companion makes a statement, a companion makes a statement, and we find no other companion opposed him in that statement. Nobody opposed him. Nobody, we don't find nobody from amongst the companions when he said that, that any other companion opposed him. Then this is also regarded as being a sunnah. And some of them have even called it to be ijma'i sukuti, a silent type of consensus. When a companion says you do this, and we find none of the other companions rebuking him or disagreeing with him, then this is something which is regarded to be a sunnah of the So, for example, we also find that from amongst the implicit type of sunnahs is that a companion he reports a narration of the Prophet and then he gives you the explanation of that report himself. That this is what it means here. This is what it means here. So he's not saying this from himself. He's explaining what the Prophet reported to him. This is also as will also be regarded if the explanation is to do with ibadah as being a sunnah, a sunnah of the from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also with regards to the Asbab al-Nuzul, the causes of revelation, that when the companions, they inform us, uh, this is how this was revealed and this is what was mentioned, then we find that these are also with regards of being a sunnah of the miniya from those implicit sunnahs of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So after understanding this, the divisions of the sunnah, after understanding the connection of the Quran and the sunnah, we come to the Next part of uh, our lecture, which is the obligation of following the sunnah. The, ex the, the obligation of following the sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوا وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ أَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا The first ayah which we mentioned in Surah Al-Hashr, ayah number seven. And take whatever the messenger gives you and abstain from whatever he forbids you. This ayah is a clear command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it is obligatory upon every single Muslim when the authentic sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa reaches him that he must follow it and whatever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa forbade, forbade us we must, abstain, we must abstain from it the second ayah is in Surah Nisa ayah number 80 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said 
الرسول فقد أطاع الله. Whosoever obeyed the messenger has indeed obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the messenger before he mentioned himself. Because the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the representative of Allah, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. He has been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everything that he legislates, everything that he explains, everything that he commands must be followed. And then we find in Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 132, wa ati'u Allah wa That for obey, uh, obey Allah and his messenger so that the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may descend upon you. So we see that one of the ways of attaining the rahmah, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to follow the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Many Muslims complain today that they have stress and they have difficulties and they have problems and they have been afflicted with many trials and tribulations. And one of the reasons of removing all these problems is to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then Allah's mercy will descend upon you and your problems will be solved. With regards to, with regards to, um, from the sunnah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith which has been reported by Imam Ahmad in his musnad and Abu Dawood in his sunan, where he said, Ala inni utitu al-Qur'anu wa mithluhu ma'a. That I have been given the Quran and something similar to it. So the Quran and the Sunnah. He said, I've been given two things. The Quran and something similar to it. And the scholars agree that every that what the Prophet said something similar to it, he meant the Sunnah of he meant his Sunnah. The Sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then in another hadith, the Prophet said in the Ma'atu Imam Malik, Taraktu fikum amrain lan tadillu ma tamasaktu bihima kitabullahi wa sunnati. That I am leaving behind two things. If you hold firmly onto two, these two things, you will never be misguided. And he said the book of Allah and the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what are the benefits of following the sunnah? So we understand the obligation of following the sunnah. We will mention five benefits briefly. The benefits of following the sunnah is the first benefit is that if you follow the sunnah, then you will stay, uh, stay away from blame with the ikhtilaf. Al-ikhtilaf al madmum that if we follow the sunnah, if everybody unites upon the sunnah, then we will find the people will not bicker and the people will not be arguing and there will not be ikhtilaf amongst the Muslim ummah. One of the other benefits of following the sunnah is that if you follow the sunnah, then the Muslims will not be divided into sects and groups. Today we find a lot of groups and sects. Why? Because the people have left following the sunnah. Because this, the result of why we see so many organizations and so many groups is because the people have abandoned following and adhering to the sunnah of Rasulullah. So if you stick to the sunnah, you will stay away and you will avoid yourself and protect yourself from falling into these groups and parties. One of the other benefits of following the sunnah is by following the sunnah, you are safeguarded and safety is given to you from misguidance misguidance. If you follow the sunnah, then you are safeguarded and protected by Allah from being misguided. One of the other benefits of following the sunnah is that you stay away from following the paths of the shayateen. As we find in Surah Al-An'am, ayah number 153, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that This is my straight path. So follow it and do not follow the paths of the, do not follow these other paths. For indeed these other paths will divide you from the straight path. So the straight path is one, Surat al-Mustaqeem, as we read in Surah al-Fatiha and in Surah al-An'am. And all these other paths that have a shaitan at the end of it calling to it, as explained by Abdullah ibn Masood in a narration which he reported from the Prophet sallallahu then we find that these paths of a shaitan and if you stick to the sunnah then you protect yourself from following these deviated paths which are paths of misguidance and if you follow the sunnah then the sunnah will protect you from humiliation and being insignificant for the first for the person who follows the sunnah 
that nobody can humiliate him. Even if he is humiliated by those who ridicule him, who don't follow the sunnah, but according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, according to Allah, then this person is to, is, has izzah. Allah has granted him izzah. And he has izzah in the, sign, in the eyes of Ahlul Sunnah. And he's respected. So following the sunnah, basically safeguards you from being humiliated and being insignificant amongst the people. That's why you find that the people of Bidah, they are humiliated. They are insignificant when it comes to those who truly follow the people, those who truly follow the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we have the last part of our lecture which is if after knowing everything with regards to the sunnah, knowing its definition in the Arabic language, its meaning Islamically and its four different categories, knowing its meaning technically as defined by the scholars of hadith and its five categories, knowing the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the actions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam divided into three categories, those which are done on the basis of ibadah, those which are done on customary and habitual uh, customary actions, habitual actions, knowing the connection of the words uh, of the sunnah with the Quran and its three categories, knowing the divisions of the sunnah, knowing the obligation of following the sunnah, knowing the benefits of following the sunnah. Then the next question that we ask is that why do people then not follow the sunnah? Why do we have a lot of people amongst us today that you don't see them follow the sunnah? We see many people who don't follow the sunnah. What are the reasons or the causes of why people don't follow the sunnah? So first of all, we have to understand that the Prophet ﷺ said, وَخَيْرَ الْهَدِي هَدِي مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ That the best guidance is the guidance of who? Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Secondly, we have to understand that the tawfiq or the ability is from who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا تَوْفِيقِ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ That the tawfiq to do good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet sallallahu said in an authentic hadith, مَن يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرَ يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ For whomsoever Allah wishes good, He gives him the correct understanding of the deen. So what are the reasons of why people don't follow the sunnah? There are mainly five reasons we find Apparently, why people don't follow the sunnah or why they are misguided from the sunnah. The first reason is al-ghulu, exaggeration in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةَ وَسَطَةَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this nation a moderate nation, a balanced nation. So we find that people have ghulu. So people have ghulu for the sheikhs. People have ghulu for certain ideologies. People have ghulu for the imams. People have ghulu for the imams that, know that when the sunnah comes to them, they reject the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu saying, but I blindly follow, oh, I am an adherent to this imam. So therefore, and we find that ghulu is a means of destruction. And all the previous nations, the nations that we find that were misguided and doomed and the punishments of Allah descended upon them, one of the key factor for this to happen was that they had ghulu. We find that the people of Nuh salam, that when they started to exaggerate with regards to the pious people, they started making pictures and hanging them and then statues and then idols and then they started asking the idols to ask on behalf of them, then they started worshipping these idols. So ghulu, the Prophet said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغُلُو Beware of exaggeration, for indeed the, the, the nations that came before you, that was one of the reasons of why they were destroyed is because they had ghulu in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we look at the Jews and the Christians, that the Jews took Uzair as the son of Allah. And the Christians took Isa ibn Maryam alayhim as salam as the son of Allah. They exaggerated so much in the prophets and then, uh, that they made them and turned them into being the sons of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a'yadhu billahi min thalik. So al-ghulu. So you have that a person has ghulu for this masjid. Or a person has ghulu for this organization. Or a person has ghulu for this imam. Or a person has ghulu for this sheikh. Or a person has ghulu for this organization or this and so forth. And this is all batil in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no such thing as ghulu or harshness in the deen. And one of the reasons of why people stop following the sunnah is because they have ghulu in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second reason of why people do not follow the sunnah is jahl, ignorance. And ignorance takes the people. If you do not know about the sunnah, then you cannot follow it. So people who are ignorant, they consider other things to be sunnah. And like we mentioned, they start fighting whether the amama is a sunnah or not a sunnah, the hat is a sunnah, not a sunnah. And they neglect all the other sunnahs which the Prophet ﷺ clearly and explicitly explained to us and told us to do, they are never mentioned. So they say eating salt is a sunnah. 
eating on the floor is a sunnah. Doing this is a sunnah. Doing that is a sunnah. And so forth. Ignorance. One of the third reasons of why we find why the people do not follow the sunnah and that is at tahazzub at tafarruq people dividing into groups and parties in order for you to follow the sunnah then you have to say that that sunnah has to be filtered through this party or this organization or this concept then i will follow the sunnah if it doesn't come from this area or this region or it's not sift away through this ideology we cannot follow the sunnah one of the other reasons of why we find that the people do not uh, follow the sunnah is because they follow their desires. Ittiba'ul hawa. Following their desires. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Afara'ayta man ittakhada ilahahu hawa. Have you not seen those who have taken the, the desires as the ilah, as the deities? So we find. So the people want to follow their desires. So they say they like music. And in the sunnah, it's been clearly explained in the in regards to the tafsir of the ayat that musical instruments are impermissible but he wants to follow his desires so he will say well it's in the sunnah it's only in the sunnah it's makru the scholars have deferred so he rejects following the sunnah of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam somebody likes free mixing so he say that which is impermissible is khalwa only to be alone but with regards to men and women being in the presence of one another one together that this is something which is not part or we don't find uh, it's not something which has been prohibited in the Quran so they neglect the Sunnah because they want to follow their desires they want to follow their desires one of the other reasons of why we find and this is a calamity in this time is taqdeemul aqli ala naql that the intellect or the brain is given preference over the text so for example he will say I'm only going to accept that which makes sense so for example he may say that the punishment of the grave is a hoax it's a delusion it's not true because if you were to open up the grave you'll see this dead person you can't feel no pain you don't see him shouting you don't see him moving so how is he being punished or how is he cherishing the bounties which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is granting him so then he will reject the punishment of the grave you will see that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that when you enter Makkah and you make Umrah in Tawaf al Qudum your, your right shoulder should become be exposed and this was something which was done. He says, why is this? This was 1400 years ago. There's no kuffar today to show that we are mighty and we are strong. So he'll reject the sunnah. For example, you will say to him that wiping over the sock on the top is a sunnah. He said, well, the dirt is on the sole, not on the top. This doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Why do we wipe, have to wipe over our socks? So these are some of the reasons, five main causes that we find why people do not follow the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So therefore, we have to abstain and stay away from these things. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guides us. And the lecture has come to an end. Jazakumullah khairan for listening patiently. If anything which I have said is correct, then it is from the book, then it is from Allah. If anything which I may have said, which goes against what Allah and Allah's Messenger have said, then it is from me and the shaitan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from that. Jazakumullah khairan wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khairan, Shaykh. Any questions from the floor? Firstly, you mentioned in terms of the Quran. That seems to suggest that the Quran has gone through some change. Sorry? You mentioned earlier the present Quran. Naam. Present Quran, naam. What I mentioned is that some of the ayats of the Quran have been abrogated. Do you understand? Some of the ayats of the Quran have been abrogated. So those ayats of the Quran have, which have been abrogated. For example, we find in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara That do not go close to even to salah in a state of being intoxicated. So this ayah shows the first drinking alcohol was only prohibited during the salah. But then we find another ayah which abrogated this. So abrogation is of two types. Abrogation is that where the ruling is abrogated and the recitation remains. Or we find that that with regards to the recitation is abrogated, but the ruling remains. Do you understand? And this is in the sciences of the Qira, which you will find. So abrogation is of different types. And as we know that the Quran was revealed in a period of 23 years. So gradually the Sharia of, of Muhammad Rasulullah was revealed in a period of 23 years. And some things were allowed during the first part of Islam. And then they were not prohibited. And this is from the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we accept. And then when the Muslims began, for example, the Prophet said, 
I prohibited you from visiting graves. Visit graves, for indeed they remind you of the Akhirah. This initiates that visiting graves in the earlier part of Islam was prohibited. But when the Sahabas became firm upon the Aqidah, and when they understood the concept of shirk, and they were firmly upon Tawheed, then this uh, band was lifted from them, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them through the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam to go and visit the graves. Naam. This is Mayuti al Rasul Fakad Atta Allah. Surah Tunisa, ayah number 80. The reason of why the Messenger of Allah was mentioned here is not that he is greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the reason of why the Messenger is mentioned is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that all success and salvation lies in following the Messenger of Allah. That the word of Allah and the commandments of Allah can only be understood if you follow the Messenger of Allah. Because the Messenger of Allah is the one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose. Muhammad Rasulullah is the one that he chose with regards to explaining and guidance and knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is given to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No. no. You kind of brushed over tacit approval. And is there any chance you could explain that a bit more? Naam. Let me give you an example. I was talking to a friend. Naam. Um, well, uh, someone I know actually, who used the explanation of Ethiopian dancing in front of the prophet. Naam. The prophet. Naam. Possibly was to display athleticism as a. Naam. It's a the famous narration in the Muslim Ahmad. Naam. With regards to this, then I have a small risala which will be published very, very soon, refuting this person who has tried to tamper and uh, distort with what actually happened in the when you look at the Arabic wordings and how he has mistranslated and so forth. But that is another topic. But going back to the issue of tacit approvals. Then, with regards to the issue of tacit approvals, then this is something which has been accepted by Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and the Ahlul Hadith. And that which we understand is that if something was done on the basis of ibadah, understand? And as we know that the, main, the narration which you mentioned was not done on the basis of ibadah, it was play for the sake of the argument. It was entertainment. So there is a difference between entertainment and ibadah. This is firstly. For something to be considered as sunnah to taqririya, then it has to be done on the basis of ibadah. Something which is done on the basis of ibadah, meaning intending to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing that action. For example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we know with regards to salah. Son, salah is a dhikr which has been legislated in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salah is a dhikr which we get close. It's an action which we do. It's one of the best actions to do. Because salah has dhikr, has tasbihat, has recitation of the Quran and so forth. So when salah was done, certain acts were done by the certain companions which the Prophet ﷺ seen and he approved of. Because the companions were always eager and enthusiastic to do good. So they would do those actions. So when he saw certain actions like this, like I gave you an example, before Salat al-Maghrib, they pray two rakats. And the generality of knowing that between every adhan and iqama, there's two rakats, he prayed and he saw them, and he approved and he also prayed. So this was an, an example that I gave you, that something which is done on the basis of ibadah, not entertainment. With regards to that issue which you mentioned is entertainment, so this qiyas is ma'al fariq. Because nobody regarded of those ahbash, the habashiyah that came, the Ethiopians that came, that they were doing an act of ibadah. They were doing an act of entertainment, which was warfare which they were practicing, and with regards to them being musical instruments, then that, then, then that was not present. Now. Now, if this, with regards to this clothing of university, uh, university graduations, if this is something which is specifically for the kuffar, then this is not permissible. Now, if this represents the kuffar, then it is not permissible. For example, let me give you. We look at the kuffar, you know the, the hats which the Catholics wear, these are not permissible. The hats with the, which the Jews wear, these are not permissible. The robes which the Christians and the Jews wear, these are not permissible. To keep your hair in the way the Jews keep, these acts are not permissible. As the Ahlul Ilm have said, if wearing those clothing which is worn on university, on graduation day, 
it means that it represents Christianity and Judaism, then this is a resemblance and not permissible. But if it doesn't, then it is permissible. So that is what you would have to find out. Wallahu alam. Okay, we'll have to be very quick with the questions because we've, got, we've literally got two to three minutes before Maghrib, inshallah. Naam. Tayyib, in regards to the issue of Rafal Yadain, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that every single thing has a beauty and the beauty of your Salah is to raise your hands. So the beauty of your Salah is to raise your hands. So if you don't raise your hands, then there is no beauty in your Salah. With regards to another narration, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that to do Rafal Yadain, that every time you do the Rafal Yadain, you get 10 extra rewards. Thirdly, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did Rafal Yadain from the time the Salah was legislated till he died till his last prayer on the face of this earth as mentioned by Hafid ibn Hajar in Talkhis al-Habid and there are over 400 narrations how many? over 400 which support that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa raised his hands before he went into Ruku and after he got up from his Ruku and from the third rakat when he, started, when he stood up that the Prophet sallallahu did Rafa Yadain Rafa Yadain is a sunnah which is an established sunnah which is mutawatir mutawatir that so many narrations have been reported from so many companions like i mentioned to you 400 narrations but we find those who do not do rafa yadain based upon a ghulu exaggeration of their madhabs that we ask that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them and we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring them closer to the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we find even amongst in their madhabs that we find eminent scholars who would raise their hands eminent scholars who would raise their hands and have declared Raful Yadain of being a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is a common narration which is always quoted with regards to not doing Raful Yadain and that is that the Sahabas in the beginning of Islam would come with idols in their armpits and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them to do Raful Yadain and that is the reason of why Raful Yadain was legislated so that when they would go into Ruku the idols would fall and they basically would not do Rafa Yadain. Then this, this, this uh, narration, firstly, we researched into this narration for many, many years. And then, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala found us a makhraj where we found the origin of this narration. And it was uh, mentioned by Sheikh Muhammad Nasir in Albani, rahmatullah alayhi, insisted that ahadith da'ifa, that this narration is a fabrication of the Rafidah. That these narrations can be reported back by the Rafidah who try to ridicule and belittle the companions. How can it be so that the companions of people of Tawheed would bring idols and make ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Secondly, it doesn't make sense. If you do Rafa Yadain whilst you start Salah, then you, the, the idols will drop. This is not hypothetically speaking. So they would not need, there would be no need for you to do Rafa Yadain the second time or the third time because the first time you say Allahu Akbar, the idols have already dropped if there was a case. But this narration is fabricated and this is a narration which is circulated. And this is tan upon the Sahaba Ridwan Allah Ajma'in. And many Ahlul Sunnah they use this not knowing that they are supporting the Rafidah, Qatalahumullah, who use these narrations in order to degrade the Sunnah of raising your hands in Salah. We also find Imam Al Bukhari Rahmatullah Alayhi, where he has mentioned in his Muqaddamah, in his book Juzul Rafa Yadain, where he mentions and where he says that the Shi'ar of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. One of the signs of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is that they raise their hands in Salah before Ruku and getting up from after Ruku. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Um, two very brief questions. Is it Sunnah to have a kunya? And is it Sunnah to pray two nafal when a person visits the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's grave? Naam. With regards to a Sunnah, to, with regards to have a kunya, then Naam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said with regards to having a kunya, then he legislated this and encouraged in find that when we, when we saw his son-in-law who had a dispute with his daughter and he was sleeping in the masjid in the dust he said Ya Abu Tarab meaning Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu so he called him and we find when uh, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Sakhra Dawsi who we known as Abu Huraira then he would play with cats the Prophet called him O oh, father of cats Abu Huraira so we find this this has been legislated by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with regards to praying two rakats when you visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa grave then this is a bidah and could lead to shirk. This has no basis in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. 
Inshallah, we'll have to leave it there now because the Maghrib prayer um, is just about to uh, start. We need to make the adhan. Uh, finally, Jazakallah uh, to the Sheikh for his extensive efforts uh, in traveling uh, to visit us today. And I would uh, want to give an open invitation, Inshallah, that you come and uh, visit us again next year. We'll try and make arrangements uh, for him um, to, um, to come and uh, deliver some lectures. Inshallah. Round about next Ramadan. Inshallah. Or even before Ramadan. Okay, Jazakallah. To spend another Ramadan in England. <laughs> Inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.